Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to Rob Osler about Devil's Chew Toy. Welcome, Rob. Good to be with you. Happy to chat books. Thank you. Me as well. I've seen you several times in person. It's always such a pleasure when I get to see you. You seem like such a happy individual, and I love that. Oh, well, good. I hope you're you're happy. happy (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I have loved, I love Devil's Chew Toy. And let me say for the audience, you were a finalist for the Anthony Award, the Agatha Award, Left Coast Crime, and McCavity. That's a pretty darned, uh, what do you call that, home run on your first debut novel. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was gratifying to see that, you know, uh, people liked it. You know, it's a different story and, you know, they tell write what you know but you know do they really is there a market for that so it, it, again it was gratifying that you know uh, that, that people that people enjoyed the book and it, it was, was well received i think it I, it's such a fun read it's i think we talked a little bit before we started recording i feel like it's such an authentic read i feel like i know these characters through and through and i've experienced them so Hayden is so much fun. He's 25 years old and on the thin side with red hair. And he, I would say, is just not the most sure person of his own abilities at the beginning of the book. Um, did you have fun writing Hayden? I did. I mean, you know, Hayden is in many ways, is, you know, me. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little smaller, right? He's five foot four rounding up. He's 130 pounds again, rounding up, you know, so he's, he's, he's diminutive of stature. And as you, as you mentioned, you know, he's got a riot of crazy red hair, um, you know, that kind of is trying to escape his scalp, you know, children, you know, on the playground, uh, trying to escape school. Um, and yeah, he's, he's, he's sweet, but he's timid and, you know, part of his journey, you know, is really kind of finding the courage that, you know, is within him that, but, you know, he has to be dragged kicking and screaming, you know, into the adventure. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, I had a lot of fun writing him because I could see myself in him, who's always more comfortable on the sidelines and better one-on-one than, you know, like at a party, you know, life of the party, I'm not, life of the party, Hayden is not. He's kind of (laughs) me exaggerated in many ways. Well, in this book, you've given him a, a cast of characters who pull him out of his self-consciousness often. And you did it so naturally. You see so many arcs with Hayden throughout the book on things that he wouldn't normally do that he ends up doing because he either knows he has to or someone else says he has to. And I like that. He's also surrounded by right. some other people who are not diminutive and uh, who are much more outgoing. And I might even call them a little bit of a bull in a China shop. So give us a flavor of some of the other yeah. characters that are in his life. Yeah. So the, the main character, the second, the second most important character is Hollister. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know Hollister's last name. It's never come up. Uh, she just goes by Hollister. Hollister. Um, I describe her as, you know, Williams with a mohawk. Um, so she is, she's got more confidence. Uh, um, she's certainly got confidence for the, the both, both of them. Um, and I purposefully liked this notion of of, of the, con- of just these, these really tremendous contrasts, right? So he's, he's small. She is large and in charge. Um, he, you know, he's white. She's black. I, I physically, I wanted to make them, you know, quite different. Personality-wise, I wanted to make them quite different. 
but then they're thrown together because they're on this, you know, mystery. It's a mystery. So, you know, the heart of the mystery throws them together to solve, to solve this, you know, is a crime at the end of the day. And what, what they find within each other is, you know, is kindness, humanity, a shared sense of humor. And, you know, and I, I just, I love the idea of the improbable friendship. Um, again, it kind of goes back to Amistad Maupin that, you know, I'm a huge fan of, and, you know, that goes back 30 some years, uh, Tales of the City, which started in, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle as, as you know, kind of weekly articles and grew into a novel. But, but you know, you had Marion Singleton, you know, in the Midwest with Michael Tolliver, you know, the, the guy about town who's gay in the big city, and they became best friends. So I, in, in a sense, I just kind of amped that up to even more, more difference between the two of them, but still brought them together as best friends. And frankly, there's a lot of comedy that that allows me just for basically physical comedy in a novel because of their size difference. And, you know, he drives, you know, like probably three miles per or under the speed limit. She <laughs> has no attention to speed limit, whatever. Um, it's, you know, so it, it's just a constant, she freaks him out, but yet he's enamored. And it, it, she forces him to lead this kind of, this aspect of his life that, you know, he was not prepared for. And he's both terrified and thrilled at the same time. But, you know, there's the tension. It is, and it's so well done. And I have to, you mentioned cars and driving. So I have to let the audience know she drives a Porsche and he drives a Ford Fiesta. If that doesn't tell the whole story right there, nothing yeah. will. <laughs> I will say that yeah. <laughs> in one scene, he stands up. There you go. There's on one scene, he stands on the top of the Fiesta. And I thought it's a good thing he's standing on top of it and not her because it wouldn't work out well for her. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She's, you know, um, I think it was Alan Orloff, who's who's a, f a friend author. Um, we got asked this question at a conference, like, who would play her in a in a in a movie? Um, which would be awesome. That hasn't happened. I doubt it will. But um, and he said, oh, and I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, Leslie Jones. And I was like, oh my god. Yes, totally. You're so right. <laughs> totally. Leslie I Jones. If you listen to this. <laughs> you need to buy. You need to buy the uh, the the media rights. Absolutely, I totally yourself. agree. And I think she could pull it off by by far, perfectly. There's also a bunch of other characters. Um, I do want to talk about Camilo. Uh, Camilo is what sort of starts the, mm -hmm. the mystery off. Um, Hayden and Camilo spend a, a night together, and then the next morning, Camilo has disappeared. And right. in real life, some people disappear because they want to disappear themselves. And also in real life, some people disappear because something has gone wrong. And a great deal of reading this book, we're trying to figure out as a, as a reader or an audience member, which of these scenarios is it? Has Camilo disappeared himself, which I know is not grammatically correct, or has someone helped Camilo disappear? And I right. think you did such a great job in... I don't want to say leading us on because I don't think that's the right way to put it, but you you gave us a mystery within a mystery to, for us to see unfold. And I thought that was done so well. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. Um, yeah. I, I, I was intrigued by the, the idea of, you know, just barely knowing someone and then they disappear, but, you know, so he, he, he has very few pieces, you know, to try to, you know, puzzle this together and understand what went on. Um, and one of the, the, the key aspects we haven't talked about yet is Camillo has a dog. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't think this will spoil it, but, you know, it's like he disappears, but the dog doesn't. And Hayden, given his big heart, it's like, well, what's going to happen with the dog? Right. So it's like when when he when he takes the dog to care for the dog, um, you know, because his owners disappeared. He's like, OK, well, now there's a problem because, you know, I live at Orca Arms. Think about that. Our yeah. Orca Arms is the name of his, of his apartment complex, like, you know, has a strict no pets policy. 
Well, that's just like another little motivation, you know, because you're always like wondering, why is this person, why, why does my protagonist care about this mystery? Why doesn't he just go home and, you know, go about his life? Well, he's got this dog. So the faster he can find Camillo, but he also liked Camillo. So he's motivated in that respect that he'd like to know what happened to this guy. But it's like, I need to find this guy's, this guy, because I need to give him his dog back. <laughs> so... And that- and that was such a fun, interesting part of the story as well. I will tell you that I love animals. Most people who know me assume I hate them because I don't want anything to do with them most of the time. But I will tell you, Commander was so adorable. I thought maybe I really should adopt a dog. But I know myself. I know I should not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it did make Commander mm-hmm. plays such a fun role in this, too. Um, Commander, when Commander meets Jerry... It shows a totally different side of Jerry and Hayden's uh, interactions with Jerry. They improve, not that they were bad before, but they improve. This dog is so lovingly written that the dog figures in as a really big part of the entire book. And that was fun to watch unfold. Yeah, and and Jerry, for for those who who yet to read Devil's Two Toy, right? He's the ninety one year old neighbor um, who lives in the town ho- ha- home adjoining Hayden's aunt, who's really his own his his closest living relative, and she's an evangelical Christian. Just to throw in some more, you know, interesting tension, um, <laughs> and yeah, and it turns out that Jerry and Commander love each other. And so it's just a fun additive to their interactions because, again, it's like, you know, you have this 25 year old gay guy and a 91 year old straight man and you make a, and he loves he loves Reagan. Um, and, and, you know, so but it's like these improbable friendships and you're trying to find the overlap of, of just humanity and shared experience that they can be friends and even with his with his aunt, who's evangelical, you know, he's like, you know, we just agree that, you know, there's just certain, you know, we've got we've, we've agreed to a, a spiritual detente. You know? So we just we don't we 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 love each other, but we know that there's just certain things we're not going to convince the other. But we just you know, we got to get along because, you know, we're family. And, you know, how true is that? Um, so, yeah, it's it's the book is a lot about uh, just the relationships that are developed and hopefully this fun romp in trying to find a missing go-go boy. <laughs> right. Well, and it does. And I will say that the aunt was so much of my dad's family. I'm so close to mm-hmm. all of my dad's family, but we are slightly polar opposites on, you know, religion and spirituality. They're all evangelicals and I am not. I get excited about Jen, not Jesus. So, you know, it's a different excitement in my life. So give us a little flavor of who Burley is. Sure. Burley is the most exaggerated of an already exaggerated cast of characters. Um, She is a literal giant. Again, I like to play with size of people. Um, So she's well over six feet tall, over 300 pounds. Um, She loves to wear Crocs. Um, We first meet her when she's hosting a lesbian kager, and she's stoned in the backyard next to the fire pit. Um, looking at the stars. Um, she's she's just a kooky, lovable, over-the-top character. Uh, she's an acclaimed baker. She has her own uh, bakery cafe named Slice, which is kind of the hangout for Hollister and Hayden. They do a lot of their kind of like, you know, thinking about the crime, you know, at, at, at Slice over these, you know, tr- you know, grotesquely huge pastries that Burley's making. Um and she's integral. She she kind of weaves in and out of the story. Near the end, she plays a heroic role in the speedboat, which she can barely fit in. Um, but yeah, I, I oh, and she's a karaoke MC, <laughs> by the way. So you know, at at Hunters, which is the the gay club that Hollister and Hayden met at, and that Hayden first met uh, the Go Go Boy, who's now missing Camillo. So they're kind of the trio, but she's. You know, she she kind of floats in and out of of, of the story, but uh, but yeah, I love I love Burley. I'm not I really did too. I thought Burley was so fun, and I've lost. Oh, and her brother Roy, you do such a great job at describing Roy, 
And you did something that I loved because on some of the times where Hayden found a voice, he found his voice with Roy, which is probably one of the places where I would think that Hayden might have become a wallflower. Yet Roy, something about Roy makes Hayden find his voice. And I loved what you did with that. And just the description of Roy, I'm like, oh, I knew a whole lot of Roy's growing up in eastern North Carolina. Yep. Well, and I grew up in in Idaho, and so there's 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 plenty of there's plenty of Roy's. Yeah, it's interesting you picked up on that because it was just you know the the pro, you know just a bridge too far, you know, just yes. sitting there kind of being held captive, not literally, but you know it, it felt that way yes. to Hayden, and just you know just kind of listening to this guy go on and on, and at some point it's just like enough, enough. Uh, all right, <laughs> you know. Come on now, you know, enough. It just, you know, he didn't so much snap as, but, but, but you're right. He kind of finally stepped up and is like, all right, hold up. It's like, I love it. And so, it. yeah, that was, that was, there's a few moments for him. Yeah. <laughs> you have really created a full, fun cast of colorful people that are interesting to read. And what goes on with all of them is very, very interesting. And I know why you're up why you were finalist in so many awards. It's just wonderful. So I also know that I believe next month, your second book comes out. Is it next month? Is that right? That's right. Uh, March 5th is a uh, uh, circle. Soleil. Fantastic. I look forward to it. I know it's going to be wonderful. Uh, again, this book is devil's chew toy. It's by Rob Osler. Rob, do you have a social media or a website you'd like to share? Sure. Uh, it's super easy. It's robosler.com. So all of my projects, um, all my stuff is there and there's social links there. I, I, I'm, I'm fairly active on, you know, Instagram and uh, Blue Sky and Twitter and Facebook. So yeah, f uh, find me there. I'm happy, happy to chat. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me, Rob. This has been such fun. Thank you for having me. I really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out with Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com, on Twitter at outwithdan, and on Instagram and Facebook at gooutwithdan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out with Dan.